last week, we, you, you may notice that your handout looks surprisingly familiar to the one last week. That's because we didn't get through the one last week at all. So we, we touched on the very beginning of it where we talked about some of the history or the timeline behind the various worldviews that, that came along. And we left off talking about the issue of modernism. Now, what we're going to get into today is postmodernism. So obviously, if you've got a postmodernism, there must be a modernism before that to be post of, if that makes any sense. So we went into modernism. We looked at that kind of that timeline with, with what was going on. And that modernism developed in the very, very late 1800s, early 1900s, and really lasted only, depending on what resource you look at, only about 30 years or so here in the United States. And if you remember, it was a situation where modernism took hold because of all the progress that was being made in society with inventions and discoveries in the scientific realm and things like that. People were thinking, wow, this is a very optimistic time period for us. Man is on a, an upward trajectory. Everything is great. Everything is going to be really, really good. It suffered a little bit of a setback in Europe because of World War I, but here in the United States, we went into the Roaring Twenties, which was a time of really a lot of uh, almost unbounded prosperity. Chicken in every pot, everybody had a Model T. You know, Henry Ford was cranking them out like crazy. You could have any, any color you want as long as you want black, you know, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of progress that was being made up until 1929 when the, when the stock market crashed, and then things started to go off the rail at that point. But modernism also had an impact on the church, too. And we talked about how modernism was kind of a downward movement within the church. You know, really focusing on the fact that we're coming into this period of great prosperity for people. Man has got all of the things figured out. So now there's this skepticism of the supernatural, of any special revelation, religion, anything like that. So the assumptions of, of Christianity that had been carried through in the West for centuries were now starting to be called into question. Things like a belief in the supernatural and trust in the revelation of scripture. All of those things were being set aside in modernism. <coughs> so modernism, you can see here with our little stairway of descent, it kind of worked its way down. First Christianity was questioned, where it's at the top, then all of a sudden the Bible's being questioned as whether or not it's infallible or inspired. It works its way down. Man is not um, made in God's image and just eventually works its way down until at the height of modernism, it gets to basically atheism. This was infecting the church as well because the church, seeing these things happening in the culture, this changing mindset about all things biblical and all things religious didn't want to get left behind in their mind. They wanted to conform to the world so that they could stay relevant to the world. And it's always an issue when the church tries to be relevant in a lot of ways. I don't know what happened to my slides all of a sudden. They're really good though, too. Hmm. Bear with me a second. They may have gone for good. Oh well. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll muddle through. I would, but they're all over in the sound booth. <laughs> So, anybody mind if I go do that? Let me do that. I'll be right back. Um, we're never quite sure. There's only, we can only get one laptop to work on this projector for some reason, and I don't know what it is. So, okay, so anyway, back to the modernism thing. We looked at, you know, Harry Emerson Fosdick. He was an influential preacher who had the backing of John Rockefeller. He was the one who preached a sermon about... Uh, uh, that there really wasn't a virgin birth, and so things kind of took off from there. Um, John D. All right, here he comes. Right there. It was working before when we got here. 
<laughs> and then it, it was working. It was work? working, yes. And then it just suddenly went blue. Okay. Like our hearts, we went blue. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, so he had a huge impact on the church because the church was trying to stay relevant. And so let's go to Romans chapter 12 quick. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. For Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And then he gives us a command. He says, Do not be conformed to this world. So when all this was taking place, uh, the church was essentially throwing out this command on the part of Paul. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So, with modernism, anything we can do to help? Um. Moral support? <laughs> yeah, pray. <That'll laughs> That's kind of a slam dunk, isn't it? Sorry about that. Can I just stick this there for now? So that's what was going on at the time. Um, and it, it, it resulted in this situation of liberalism in the church. And the liberalism is what has affected the mainline denominations even up to today. There was a divide that basically was created at the time, liberalism versus fundamentalists. And that's really the time when that whole idea of fundamentalism came about was in this time period. And one individual who was involved in that was this guy, J. Gresham Machen. I mentioned him last week. He wrote this book called Christianity and Liberalism uh, because he was fighting back, pushing back against the influence of the liberalism within the church. And so to even today, the impact of that time period, even though modernism has essentially gone away, um, the negative events or the negative things that were taking place in the church at the time uh, are still being influenced. And we mentioned at the time, too, that one of, the, one of the biggest dangers, in fact, what Machen said was, if I can quote, he says, the greatest menace to the Christian church today, and keep in mind this was written in 1922, comes not from the enemies outside, but from the enemies within it. It comes from the presence within the church of a type of faith and practice that is anti-Christian to the core. I don't know how many of you, if any of you get World Magazine. It's a very good magazine with the news from a Christian perspective. And I was reading an article in there over the weekend talking about uh, the notion of gay identity is taking root in evangelical churches. Where it says, among white evangelical Protestants, and I have this on a slide so you just have to take my word for it, um, acceptance of same-sex marriage rose from 11% in 2004 to 29% in 2019. So as of 2019, 29% uh, of white evangelical Protestants, which is us, um, according to Pew survey. All right, way to go Dawson. See, there it is. And 40%, yeah, what'd you do? He prayed. <laughs> and 40% who attend religious services once a week now favor same-sex marriage. Now, I don't know if that 40% includes mainline denomination members too. I would suspect it probably does uh, for that to be up there. And that's led this Thomas Kidd, who's a church historian, He's, this is a quote from him that I found in the article as well. It suggests that, traditional, that the traditional biblical view of marriage and sexuality is no longer a defining principle of the evangelical movement. So that leads us to this whole idea of postmodernism. Postmodernism is really a response to modernism. It's a reaction to modernism and the failings of modernism. In the 1930s, we saw things like Hitler coming to power in Europe. We had the Great Depression, which started in 1929. We saw the rise of uh, 
warfare in the Far East with Japan, trying to conquer China, things were not working out very well. And so people were starting to get disillusioned with this whole idea of man being able to advance and solve all of our problems and things like that through reason. So postmodernism was really a reaction to that failing of modernism. It's kind of a disillusioned response to the failure of modernism to improve mankind and make the world a better place. One of modernism's beliefs was that absolutes did exist. Postmodernism, they don't like that idea. They don't like the idea that absolute truth, for example, exists. Absolutes are a modern, modernism idea, and postmodernism says, no, nope, that's not the case. There's no such thing as absolutes. They're very suspicious of what are called meta-narratives. A meta-narrative is a truth that transcends all peoples, all places, all time. It's, something, it's kind of an overarching story, if you want to call it that, an overarching narrative that's true everywhere. Postmodernism says, no, we don't think there's what's known as, as a meta-narrative, that overarching truth that's out there. Postmodernism also teaches that ultimate reality is really inaccessible. We can, it really can't be known. What is really real? Okay? What is really real? You know, we've talked about this before with metaphysics. You know, what is real? Postmodernism says, I don't know. We can't know. We can't know what's really real. Now, is that a very good foundation to build a bridge on? A literal bridge? If we can't really know anything, it gets to be a challenge. And any knowledge that is out there is really what's called a social construct. In other words, it's just kind of made up. It all depends on the society in which you're in. It all depends on what group you're in. So knowledge can vary depending on the group, depending on how that group sees knowledge in a postmodernism world. It's all dependent. It depends on which group you're in. It can vary from one group to another. And any claims to truth are really political power plays. Now, we, when we were talking about um, Marxism and critical theory, we got into this idea of hegemony, the hegemonic power. Okay, people, certain people in the world of the Marxist and the world of critical theory says certain groups of people have the power and they're able to impose their will on other oppressed groups. So what postmodernism is saying too is that anytime somebody makes a truth claim, it's really all about politics. And it's really a, a political power play because that group has that hegemonic power over the oppressed groups. Yes? It does sound like a meta-narrative, like meta doesn't it? Well, wait a minute now. Aren't we starting to see some cracks forming in, this, in the logic of this worldview? <laughs> Very good. You caught on to that, Joanne. That's good. That's good. And, Paul, go ahead. Well, transgenderism. Yep, I know. Judge not. I know. Does that mean we can never, ever, ever judge anything? So, if reading, reading further in this article, there was an interesting quote here. And this is where things get challenging for us as individual believers and as a church. Um, this is coming from a guy named uh, Christopher Yuan, I think is how you pronounce his name, who came out of the homosexual lifestyle. Um, he says, evangelical drift always begins with this desire to be compassionate and loving. He says that's not a bad thing. Now here's the crux of the argument. The issue comes when we are busier listening to the marginalized and not letting their stories be filtered through the lens of scripture. 
In other words, we're not looking through th at things with a biblical worldview. That's what he means by filtering through a lens of Scripture. It's very important for us to be loving and compassionate, but the love and compassion that we're demonstrating needs to be filtered through that biblical worldview. Because we have a God who is perfectly loving, but also perfectly righteous. And for us as believers, as human beings, it gets to be a very big challenge to balance that issue of grace and truth. If anybody can figure it out how to get right where it needs to be, the only person that's ever had that ability has been Jesus Christ. Perfect balance of grace and truth. We all tend to lean one way or the other. But in a lot of ways, that is, that is what can happen, is when, when we start to become, when we start to look at things unbiblically, not through that lens of biblical truth, that's when things get off the rails. Make sense? Eric. We're always trying to, as a church, love on the people and let them know that they're loved by us. And I kind of thought it was a firm hand and a loving hand. You know, we have to keep pursuing what was godly and, and right things for the, the town and, and things as opposed to what was going on. But on the other hand, we just love them to death. And uh, it kind of culminated, there was a, I called him a town troll. He stood on the edge of the, not to his face. <laughs> spirited guy, but inwardly I knew there was a little niceness in him, but uh, oh, one year his mailbox had got hit, some long that line Christmas, I bought him a mailbox, threw some gloves in for some people in his, uh, his little house and stuff like that. So I was trying to love on him, yet not giving up that what's right thing. And I had heard back one time anyway, that he had said, well, you know, regarding that preacher, uh, what is, I don't like him, but he's a nice guy. <laughs> uh, that's kind of that balance there, you know, you need to do your good work so that they glorify your father and see him. Have a hard time breaking muck up and throwing it at you, but on the other hand, you can't give up the mothership either. Right, so exactly. It is a challenge, even in ministry in towns. And our exactly. So, I know I, that's a struggle that I have, this whole balance of grace and truth. I tend to lean on the truth side. And there are times when I shouldn't do that. So, it's, it's important. So, anyway, postmodernism. Also, they reject this idea of the correspondence theory of truth. Remember, we may remember we talked about this. Correspondence theory of truth is the idea that truth is what corresponds to reality. Okay, they believe a postmodernist would say that should be thrown out because we can't say objectively that there is truth. We can't say objectively that there is uh, this meta narrative, for example. That would be a meta narrative. This correspondence theory of truth would be meta a meta narrative, and that there are no meta narratives unless you're a postmodernist who believes there are no meta narratives because that's a meta narrative. So. <laughs> So they reject the idea that universal truth can be known. All we can know is whether our individual experiences are true for me. So have you ever heard the phrase, what's true for you isn't true for me? That's where this comes from, is that there is no universal truth. All we have is what our individual experiences tell us are true for us as individuals. So they reject reason that applies everywhere and all the time. Reasonableness in their minds, in a postmodernist mind, is based on whatever various groups find reasonable. So it gets back to this issue of groups again. We saw this in critical theory and in Marxism. Whatever that group finds reasonable, that's what is reasonable. That's what, that, that is reason. Whatever narratives or traditions or institutions or practices that a group finds reasonable 
That's what applies. Now we see this, for example, in what's going on in Israel right now. We have two groups. We have Hamas. And in Hamas's mind, in this postmodern thinking, violence against Jews is a reasonable thing. Extreme violence, apparently, the way it sounds. They also reject the idea that we can be objective in our knowledge. Everything is dependent on our experiences. We're all situated in our experiences. They use that phrase, situated, meaning we can't see issues objectively because we are limited by our experiences. Now, there's a certain element of truth to that because we are all kind of colored by what we have seen and experienced in life. But what I have experienced in life Just because, uh, the, let, let me see how I, hmm. knowledge that is truthful is still truthful regardless of what I have experienced. That's probably the best way for me to put it. In other words, if something is true, if something is truthful, it's true and it's truthful regardless of my experience in life. I'm the one who's got it wrong, not the truth. The truth is correct. I'm the one who's not understanding the truth or misapplying it or whatever. So, but what a postmodern mind would say, both with the truth and even with things that are real, things are real regardless of what my experience may say. So, for example, the whole issue of whether or not there's God, there is a God, okay? That would be a situation where well, a postmodern person would say, well, I've never experienced God, so how can there be one? Even though there's very good evidence, and I believe that there is a real God. So just the fact that I've experienced things a certain way in life doesn't make the things that are truthful and the things that are real untruthful or unreal, if that makes sense. But in a postmodern mind, that would be the case. And they reject the idea of narratives, those meta-narratives that try to explain everything in the world and make claims of universally valid, neutral, and objective knowledge. In other words, postmodernism would say, nope, there's nothing that's universally true. There are no meta-narratives out there that are universally true. No overarching stories. They say the world is too fragmented and complex to say that any one worldview would explain everything. And as a result, oftentimes they reject the idea of God. Go ahead, Paul. Was that mean that they would reject totally all history and all science? Essentially, because we didn't experience it, so how can we know that it's true? So it could be changed. You know, it's interesting. To whatever they feel like. To whatever they feel like. So it's interesting, a little. Joseph Stalin ran the Soviet Union during World War II. Stalin died, Nikita Khrushchev came along. At that point in time, within months of Stalin dying, there was a concerted effort within the Soviet government to erase Joseph Stalin. He was removed from the history books. He was airbrushed out of photos, all types of things like that. So. Go ahead. Every, every single statue of Joseph Stalin is gone. Yeah. It's as, as if he did not exist. Yep. Oh, I'm sure. So also, they reject the idea that we can build social systems that make objective decisions. Because in a postmodernist world, there are no objective decisions that can be made. Now, where would this have a huge impact? How about with the law? We want the law to be objective, right? When the law is being administered, when the law is being enforced, when punishment is being given out, we want it to be objective, based on the law. And postmodernism would say, nope, 
There are no systems that people can put in place that are objective to meet that criteria. Things like the law, knowledge about social order, it's all constructed through the language we use to describe reality to ourselves and by its very nature is all biased. Now, can bias be introduced into the application of the law? Sure, because we're fallen human beings. But at least here in the United States, we, the founding fathers tried to build some protections into the system in order to keep the bias to a minimum or the influence of the bias to a minimum. And they reject the idea that a person can be neutral. Our culture, our language, history, even our gender, they all determine what we see in the world. And because -moder modernism's beliefs were absolutes, so modernism had that absolute belief, they believed that absolutes did exist, postmodernism seeks to correct that idea, first by eliminating the concept of absolute truth, and then making everything, including science, and religion relative to a person's individual beliefs and desires. It's all about me and what I think is true. And it plays out, postmodernism has a big role in language too, language and words. Because there is no objective and absolute truth, everything becomes a matter of personal interpretation. So the origin of a text the origin of any kind of a text, any kind of a book, is the writer, correct? So whoever that writer was, that's not important. The writer of the book does not have the correct interpretation of his own work. The reader is the one who actually determines what the book means. That's through a process that's called deconstructionism. We talked about that earlier. Through this deconstruction, and given that there are multiple readers of most every book, but only one author, how many meanings can we have in that book? Infinite number, seven billion if everybody on the planet read the book, okay? So naturally many supposedly valid interpretations, seven billion if everybody on the planet read the book, and that whole idea can be summed up with the statement that's, that's just your interpretation. That's where this idea of biblical hermeneutics comes in. Hermeneutics is the art and science of Bible interpretation. And Tara's back there smiling because she's been through a class on hermeneutics. So what hermeneutics is all about is the idea that when we look at scripture, we're going to try to determine what the, you know, it must be me. There we go again. We'll get through it. So the writer of scripture, our goal in interpreting scripture is to, there you go. <laughs> now that, that is bizarre. <laughs> that is bizarre. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. So, but hermeneutics is all about, hermeneutics is all about trying to, to get out of it. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Good backup plan. But hermeneutics is, is about trying to get what did the writer and the author mean? And the ultimate author of scripture is God himself. So what was God trying to convey to us through the human writers of the scriptures? So hermeneutics says we should look at the Bible and interpret it using what's called a literal grammatical historical approach. Meaning when I read a passage, I should read it like I would read any other form of literature. I should take that literally unless there's good reason for me to see it as something figurative. Samson, tying together the tails of 300 foxes, there's nothing in there that tells me that should be figurative. So I should take that literally. That's, an, that's as, as crazy as it sounds, it's, it's a literal statement that's being made. The historical approach is, how do I see this? Can I put myself into the time period 
that it was written as much as possible so I can understand the historical context. And the grammatical piece of it is I will use the tools of grammar in working through my interpretation of what this passage says. If it seems like the writer is using a metaphor, um, I should see it as a metaphor, figurative language, things like that. So that is the correct way to go through it. But what oftentimes happens with this deconstruction of language and words, language structures um, will affect how people think about things. And if we can eliminate certain words and promote others, maybe we can change the way people think. At our very first class, I think I brought up the topic of um, stolen words. There's an example. We can change the way people think. If you've ever read um, George Orwell's 1984, he talks about newspeak. Newspeak was something that was promoted by the government, I think it was Oceana, uh, in order to limit how people could start to think critically by limiting the language. Limiting the language so that they would not be able to think critically um, and come up with different ideas. So, if we can change the way people think about things by eliminating certain words, promoting others, that's another part of this whole thing. In fact, there's a definition. Deliberately ambiguous and contradictory language used to mislead and manipulate the public. That's what newspeak is. So, to kind of sum it up for postmodernist thinking. Capital T truth cannot be directly known. There are only small t truths that are particular to a society or a group. In other words, truth varies depending on who we're talking with. And it's limited to our individual perception and experience. Now obviously that's going to create a pretty chaotic situation if everybody's running around with their own version of the truth. It makes it impossible to make any meaningful judgments or distinctions between things. And that includes between right and wrong. It makes it very difficult to distinguish between right and wrong when everyone is running around with their own truth. And so, as a result, we lose discernment. We lose that ability to discern what is truth because there is no standard that can be used anymore. The standards have been thrown out. And that's especially true in matters of faith and religion. So when this law, when this ability to discern goes away, especially in those areas of religion, for example, now all beliefs get to be considered to be equally valid. What's known as? Eric. Eric. Another quote by George Orwell said, speaking the truth at times of universal deceit is a revolutionary act. There you go. There you go. Speaking the truth in times of universal deceit is a revolutionary act. Speaking truth in times of universal deceit. So let's be revolutionaries. So we have this resulting in this religious this philosophical religious pluralism. If, so if there's no absolute truth, the absolute truth doesn't exist, and there's no way to make meaningful distinctions between right and wrong, or between different religions, different faiths, or between spiritual truth and spiritual falsehood, there's no way to make that distinction, then the natural conclusion becomes all beliefs must be considered equally valid. So with pluralism, no religion has the right to make the claim of being true and all others are false. There's no way to make the distinction. There's no such thing as heresy or false teaching in a postmodern world because everything is valid. The only heresy is the view that there are heresies. And we need to completely dismiss the idea that God's word is authoritative. Go to John chapter 14. We're going to read something that 
is very upsetting in a postmodern world. John 14, verse 6. So, Martin, thanks for the Bible. It's not the New American Standard, but we will, we will, pu we will push for it. It's also got very small print. <laughs> well, there it is. <laughs> Jesus said to him, he's talking to Thomas here, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, there's no reason to see this as any kind of a figure of speech. So I can take this literally. And there's really no uncertainty about what Jesus is saying here. It's that he is the way, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And then jump over to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Peter is giving his sermon here. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Those two verses are basically the absolute truth claims of Christianity. Christianity claims to be absolutely true. And in Christianity, in the biblical worldview, there are meaningful distinctions between right and wrong. And that to be correct in its claims about God, all other religions must be incorrect. Because if what Jesus said is true about access to the Father is only through him, that's the only option. Every other religion is incorrect. But what does a person who says that get labeled with? You're intolerant. You're arrogant. Paul. Why would the postmodernists think that religion has any function at all? It's the self acceptance. It means nothing. They, um, they're giving, they're, they're, they're giving ground in allowing religion to be here, unlike other worldviews which would say no religion at all, for example, Marxism. They're accommodating religion and the idea that religion exists. However, what they won't accommodate, what a postmodern worldview doesn't accommodate, is exclusivity of a religion. Does that make sense? Okay, so postmodernism, it really boils down to there is no absolute truth. Truth is relative. It also boils down to this loss of discernment. Everything becomes a matter of personal interpretation. It also boils down to the, this philosophical religious pluralism. All religions are equally valid and equally truthful. Postmodernism is essentially the height of hypocrisy. If you think about it, if it's true, because there is no absolute truth, we could never really know that it's true, right? By saying that there is no absolute truth, it's making at least one absolute truth claim. So do we start to see some fracturing here? The test of reason, that worldview test, that test of reason, it says, is it reasonable? We're starting to see cracks here in, in that worldview. So, there, right off the bat, is one absolute truth, that there is no absolute truth. Its philosophers, the ones who promote the idea of postmodernism, like to deconstruct the written work of other people. But they expect us to believe that their work should not be deconstructed. A little bit hypocr hypocritical? <clears throat> they expect the people who are reading their books to take that as absolute truth. Richard. A lot of what? In Germany they did. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, so Muslims would not tolerate homosexuality. Not sure where you're going with this. <laughs> A lot. Their version of right is based on the particular worldview that they have. It's their view. <clears throat> now, we know that there is absolute truth, right? Okay. And we find absolute truth here because we have a, a moral authority, uppercase M, uppercase A, that moral authority being God. And so, therefore, this book, which is the work of God, carries moral authority, lowercase m, lowercase a. And so what this book says about the issue of homosexuality, it doesn't say go out and kill them, but it does say it's a sin. Homosexual practice is a sin. So we are called as believers, and even someone who may have that, uh, that bent is called as a believer to what's called mortify that sin, kill it. We're not to glorify it or anything like that. We're not to accept it. We're to mortify it. Try to kill that sin in our lives. I don't know. Does that help? Oh, Leah. Um, I saw a video of, I don't know if he was former Hamas or something, but he said that they allow homosexuality because it's a great distraction while they do all the planning. Sure. While the Western world is running around um, doing what we do, they have an, a different agenda. And they're used, like you say, they use that as a, as a way to distract us from paying attention to their agenda. So, Brad. Um, I was just going to say, you know, we kind of have a cliche of, uh, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. Right. And I don't. Gets back to that balance of grace and truth. Yeah. Yep. Some people are very good at loving the sinner, forgetting about hating the sin. Other people are very good at hating the sin, but forgetting to love the sinner. It's a challenge for all of us as believers. So where is all this kind of led? Nowadays, postmodernism is still out there. It's still going on, but it's leading to what's called post-truth. And post-truth is an environment in which facts are viewed as irrelevant. In fact, in 2016, the Oxford English Dictionary said this was the international word of the year, post-truth. It's an environment in which facts are viewed as irrelevant or less important than personal beliefs and opinions. And emotional appeals are used to influence public opinion. It is a post-truth. Um, well, <clears throat> Yeah, not, but not necessarily. It all depends on which group you're in. <laughs> so, it's come down to, it, this is a world in which the very idea of truth has become unimportant or irrelevant. Even if there is truth, it doesn't matter anymore. It's become unimportant or irrelevant and in, in the pursuit of a particular outcome. So if we're pursuing a particular outcome, the truth doesn't matter, as long as we get our outcome. Paul. Well, the best example is the mainstream news media. They make up stories all the time. I said, it's Trump, so they'll make up any story at all they want. And it's effective in getting him to, uh, you know, start making him have trouble, then it's worth doing. It doesn't matter what the lie is. Lying is in, in there's lying to them means nothing. Lying, if, if 
if it has a good lie, it, it's, that serves their purposes, it's a good thing. So maybe it's encouraging to know, though, that this is not a new thing. It used to be called yellow journalism, where journalism was used to kind of inflame the public to go a certain direction. So in an environment like this, people are more likely to accept an argument based on their emotions and their beliefs rather than one based on facts. So people choose a narrative, it's driven by emotion, by their ideology, by their political views or social agendas or pragmatism, which says whatever works best or whatever makes me feel good, that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, then, and to that point is that as believers, we have a role for what Brad was saying. We need to try to find that balance. The love that we show to sinners should be through the filter of a of biblical truth. It is not loving to tell someone that their sin is not sinful. It is loving to tell someone in a loving manner that your sin is a sin against God. Easier said than done. So, so with regard to this whole idea of post-truth, it's all driven by emotion. It's all driven by pragmatism, what we want. We want a truth that conforms to our own point of view and it affirms what we already believe. We're going to sacrifice the facts to advance an agenda or to affirm my pre-existing ideas. So instead, we get what's called truthiness. The quality of seeming or being felt to be true, even if not necessarily true. So post-truth thinking really thrives because people have become confused on what truth even means. There is, for example, subjective truth. Subjective truth is what, something where we can legitimately say, it's true for you, but not true for me. I don't like green peppers on my pizza. But my daughter does. <laughs> so it's true for her, but it ain't true for me. It's personal preference. We're, we're, trying, we're trying to get her to change, but <laughs> we did not find her on the front porch, no. And then there is also objective truth. Objective truth are statements of reality, and statements of reality are true or false, regardless of how I feel about them. I have a very strong opinion about green peppers on my pizza, but on some other things that are objectively true, it doesn't matter what I feel about it, it's still true. But post-truth would say, no, that does not, that's not the case. So the culture, the culture doesn't deny the existence of objective truth, but it does argue what does and does not constitute objective truth. So in a post-truth world, they're willing to say, yes, there is objective truth, but some things that were previously considered to be objective truth are no longer objective truth and they now fall into the subjective truth realm. So, let's look at some examples. I'm gonna give you a little quiz. I want you to tell me whether this statement is objective truth or personal opinion. <laughs> According to your worldview. Jesus is the Son of God. Objective truth or personal opinion? I'm obviously in the right place. Okay. <laughs> How about 
Marriage is between one man and one woman. Objective truth. Boy, you were very, very strong on that one. How about gender is fixed, not fluid? <laughs> yeah, where, where do we stand on that one? Maybe we better get polled here like they did in World Magazine. So, nowadays, in a post-truth world, though, we all know how we feel about these, or I think every one of you who's spoken up anyway. If you don't feel that these are objective truth, let's talk afterwards. Uh, but nowadays, these statements are now considered to be statements of personal opinion rather than objective truth in a post-truth world. And it's all based on who gets to decide what is objective truth. And in a post-truth world, I get to decide what is objective truth based on my preferences. So truth becomes personal. And every truth is equally valid because everybody has their own truth. My feelings are really what count in a world like this. So, post-truth is born the moment the objective is placed in the position of the subjective. And a post-truth world is not one in which truth has ceased to exist. Truth is still there. But it is a world where truth has ceased to matter. It doesn't matter anymore what the truth is. Paul. If somebody who has a postmodern point of view just kept to themselves, there would be no problem. They could just live their own life, they could do it their own way, but they insist on giving our approval for it and making us agree with them. That's where the problems come in. Because it's all based on my personal preferences and there is no objective truth anymore. Everything is subjective. And they want us to believe that. Right. That's really the goal of postmodernism, is to try to get that mindset, in, in that worldview, into individuals. And to have a worldview that acknowledges the existence of a truthful meta-narrative, like Christianity, that's intolerant. Joanne. Right. You are not allowed to say that I can't call you cisgender. So they, they're insisting on objective truth, not simply related to what a person believes, but your, this is objective truth. What they believe is they believe to be objective truth. So they won't, they won't recognize that. Right. So again, we start to see the cracks in the logic here. And they, de they demand objective truth every time they drive over a river on a bridge. <laughs> that bridge was designed and built objectively using objective truths. Other comments? All, all of this can be cut through by saying, ultimately, truth doesn't matter until you're on the TV and you have a lie. There you go. Yep. Truth doesn't matter until you're on the receiving end of a lie. It all depends on whose ox is being gored, as the old saying goes. So. Where I'm at, what I expect is the truth. Give me the truth. And it's not to my advantage to be lied to. Other thoughts? Oh, I think there should be equality between all the genders. Okay, 
Now that right there ought to be a great indication that you are agreeing with her, but, they, but if we have to inform her that, we don't even know we're being lied to. We don't know what questions to ask. We don't know how to be discerning. Thank you for teaching us. <laughs> So we're, we're about out of time. Let me, let me close with this one statement, and I, I'm not sure where I found this. But this is a quote. It says, when someone says there is no such thing as truth, they are asking you not to believe them. So don't. <laughs>